Okay. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Before we get going, I would like to invite your uh, first year rep uh, up to the stage, Dorna. Do you want to just grab that mic and I'll show your slide here? Thank you. All right, good. Go ahead. Uh, is this working? Yes, it is. Uh, hello, everyone. Do you like dancing, karaoke, cosplay, free introverts in the audience, board games, for the lifestyle tunes in the audience, dismembering organic life forms? If you said yes to any of that, please come to the Physics Union Halloween party happening this Friday. It, it goes from 6 to 9.30 in room one, in one, in 110 in McLennan Laboratories, but outside the, outside the labs, we'll be starting with, a com with pumpkin carving at 5.30. Afterwards, from 6 p.m. and onwards, there'll be a costume competition, foosball, again, board games, and many other activities you can do throughout the night. There'll be prizes involved for a scarily fun night. Be there. If not, be a four-sided shape and starting with us. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Okay, that sounds like fun. Uh, oh. <laughs> so now <laughs> for something completely different. This was the top hat question I was going to ask uh, last time, so I've just sent this to your, to your screens, I hope. Um, so yesterday, I pushed uh, a box, which was initially at rest, so that's the initial state. Then I pushed it from one side of my office to the other by sliding it along the carpet. You can kind of imagine that. And then I stopped pushing it, and so the final state is that it's as at rest as well. Um, so which of these following statements about the work done on the box um, is true? So I think the system here is the, uh, is the box, I guess. <laughs> Silence. Okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to, to read that through and think about it. I'd like you to pair up, discuss with your neighbor what you think uh, the answer is. Give you 60 seconds. Okay, 15 seconds to click in and answer, please. Remember, it's 80% uh, for participation, so. Okay, so let's, let's see what survey says. Ooh, pretty split. Either A or C. Uh, I did positive work on the box. A is Friction did negative work on the box, and there was net positive work done on the box. Um, so this is this idea, so I think most people agree that I did positive work on the box as my force was in the direction of sliding, and friction did negative work on the box because it was in the opposite direction of sliding. So this is about net work, and I think the idea with net work is that it's equal to the change in kinetic energy. So if you think of the work done by all the forces on the box, 
um, that would be like the, the net force or something on the box. Net force causes something to accelerate, so it, have, it should have a different um, speed at the end than it has at the beginning if there's net work done in the box. So, since the initial situation is that it's at rest, and the final situation is that it's at rest, I would say that it does, that there's zero net work done on the box. Sort of the work, we call it this the work kinetic energy theorem, is that net work causes a change in, in kinetic energy of the box, of the system. Any questions about that one? Do you wanna, are you guys okay? <laughs> I'm seeing heated arguments in the front row, so. Okay. I will, I will revisit this. I think the last question is, is kind of going through this again. So um, let's move on a little. Oops. Uh, let's go here. This morning's pre-class quiz was sort of about this and idea that I would sort of sketch it out as would be like the initial is that it's sitting here. And then the final position is that it's sitting over here. And there's some sort of like distance that has traveled D. Okay. And while it's being pulled, there's uh, F pull and F K, the, the sliding friction. These are the forces on the box if you define the, the box as being the system. Okay. Uh, so let's just here. Um, this is just a little kind of little ad for tomorrow's colloquium called Good Cubits and Good Codes. So it's, it's a research talk, so it will be, and it's by a theorist, so these were these are always uh, a little high level, but it is cutting thick edge physics research. This is uh, Professor Shruti Puri at Yale University, one of the smartest people on the planet, already been working, winning um, awards for her research and coming to talk. So it's exciting talk. All are welcome. Um, I'm going to include a little link there to the uh, um, to that uh, to one of her, her talking. Also, uh, from pre-class survey, this comes up a lot in the pre-class surveys. Is uh, just a little uh, <laughs> shout out to Jonathan. So well, well done. <laughs> He's got a he set up a mouse trap up here. So. Uh, <laughs> When I talk about stored potential energy, we've got a little bit of a surprise for you there. Um, also, why is everyone so clever? So you are clever too. All, every state, so you all are here, students at U of T. I'm very impressed with this class, by the way, and everything that you're doing and all these conversations I'm having in office hours and um, keep up the good work. Also, go my. <laughs> I get this comment a lot as well. So keep, keep it going. Does university get easier? Please say yes. Yes. <laughs> um, so, so I'll just tell you that, yeah, I think that my first semester at university was for me the hardest. That was the big transition. I just had to figure out basically what was going on on campus, where I had to be, what the expectations were on me. Um, I found it very overwhelming. And once I got into the swing of just how the heck this place works, and I could focus more on, on the on the schoolwork stuff, the actual like learning some things, then um, it did get easier for me in a sense. The, the courses themselves got a little harder, but, um, but my life got easier, I think. It was pretty... Oh, and there's a joke, terrible physics joke of the day. Why is it good to be put up on a pedestal? You have greater potential. <laughs> so, and that's a segue right into gravitational potential energy which stores the work that is done against gravity. So if I take this microphone and I push it up, I'm doing work on the microphone and I can place it right here on the very edge of this table. <laughs> and anybody who's a parent sees something resting on the edge of the table like this makes you intrinsically nervous because you just think that somehow it's gonna, yeah, especially if it's like something breakable, because it has the potential to fall and then convert that potential energy into kinetic energy and smash into a bunch of bits. So there is an equation. I have put the little triangle for delta in front of U sub G 
to represent the change in gravitational potential energy. So if this thing falls, there will be a change in y. y final minus y initial is the delta y. And then there will be a change in gravitational potential energy. But what it means is that as y goes up, gravitational potential energy increases. And what this is due to is that there's a constant um, gravitational force, mg, uh, always acting on, on this object, if you're near the Earth's surface. OK. So note that there is an arbitrary zero point in this equation. So you can place the origin of your coordinate system, and thus the zero of potential energy, anywhere you want. You could place it on the floor, which makes some sense. I suppose you could even place it down here on this floor, <laughs> which also makes even more sense, I guess, but it's up to you. You could say it has zero there or zero up there. So why does it work? The reason is that um, it's only, physically, it's only the change in u sub g that matters. It's not the, uh, the absolute value of it. So here is a rock suspended in midair. <laughs> I don't know how that's happening, but let's just imagine it's floating there. Maybe it's made of unobtainium or something. Anyway, uh, it has, so in Amber's quite reasonable coordinate system, zero is at the floor and the rock is floating one meter above the floor. So she would say this rock has 9.8 um, joules of gravitational potential energy. And so it might fall, and if it was to hit the ground, then it would have zero joules of gravitational potential energy, and you, it might pick up one joule of kinetic energy on the way down. So Bill has this strange idea that zero is, at, is up here. I don't know why, but he defined it to be that way. So he would say this rock has zero potential energy. And he's correct the way he's defined his coordinate system. And the way it works is that if it goes down to the floor, then Bill will say it now has negative 9.8 joules of potential energy down at the floor. So it will have lost, again, 9.8, and so it could pick up um, 9.8 uh, joules of kinetic energy and still have zero energy when it's down at the, at the floor. So both people physically argue that uh, as, as it falls, it, go, it picks up energy. And so, so this is a whole new way of looking at falling. So I would say, back in chapter two even, that there's a force of gravity on this tennis ball, and as it goes down, it accelerates due to that force of gravity. But now, I'm saying something which is mathematically equivalent, but it's conceptually kind of different, which is that, oh, here, this tennis ball has lots of u sub g, gravitational potential energy, but zero kinetic, because I'm releasing it from rest. Then when I release it, it travels downwards, and its gravitational potential energy, this mg times y or whatever, is decreasing. So by conservation of energy, the kinetic energy increases, so that as gravitational goes down, kinetic goes up, and that's why it speeds up. So let's do a top hat question. I'll put it on here. I have to send it to you. Three balls are thrown from a cliff with the same speed, but at different angles. So it's always um, V0, V0, V0 or something, or V initial. V initial in that direction, V initial in this direction, and V initial in this direction. But it's the same speed. So um, VI is same for all three balls. Which ball has the greatest speed just before it hits the ground? Uh, I'll let you think pair share, please. <laughs> Seem to have forgotten the image on the top hat screen, but I'll send it to you later for the video people.
So please click in and answer for that. In 10 seconds. Okay. Survey says. Okay. So I think that the answer is, I think there was around 73% that all balls have the same sweep. The, the next one was ball C, I guess. It goes up and it goes down. But what I would do here is I would use um, this E final, conservation of energy. E initial equals E final. And so you'd say that, um, I guess, K initial plus UG initial equals K final plus UG final. So that's the, that's the idea here. And the kinetic energy doesn't depend on the direction. It just depends on the uh, speed. So you've got one half mass times V initial squared plus um, MGH initial, which I've drawn there, equals one half MV final squared um, plus uh, MGH final, which this one will go to zero, I think. Uh, but in this, all these cases, just before it hits the ground, you got V final, V final, V final. They should all be the same because it's the same exact equation for all three of them. The direction doesn't matter. Okay. So free fall is a situation where there's no external work being done on the ball as it travels, so you can use conservation of energy. I guess there is external work being done by air resistance, but we've neglected that. Okay, so another way of looking at this, it's just, yeah, it's good. Um, I hold a ball at a distance five meters above the ground and release it from rest. How fast is it going just before it hits the ground? So I would, I can just sort of show it here. Uh, initial, uh, initial. Looks like this, you've got um, V initial equals zero, it's released from rest, and H initial equals 5.0 meters. And then final, is you've got V final equals question mark, just before it hits the ground, and then H final is equal to zero. So I guess in the simplifying diagram step, you could draw your, um, your bar charts if you want. So you'd say K initial plus UG initial equals K final plus UG final. And what I've tried to draw there is that initially the bar charts are weighted with everything on the potential and then finally it's, it just swaps places there. So I represent that mathematically as zero plus MGH initial, that's the initial energy, uh, equals one half mb final squared plus zero. Okay. So I've got, the basic equation is that energy initial equals energy final. And you just add up all the components of energy and some of them are zero. Okay. So, and then you can solve that. I think you can divide both sides by m. m's cancel, that's lucky. And then you say G H initial equals V final squared over two. You get V final is equal to square root of two G H initial. And which is, might look familiar to you from a chapter two. We ended up with equations like this all the time. And that's what I was saying is that mathematically, there is no difference between this and, and using kinematics like chapter two, but it's just a different way of looking at things. I think I got 9.9 .9 meters per second. for five meters, which is just what you would have got if you had used kinematics. Okay. Let's do another top hat question. A hockey puck is sliding on smooth ice at four meters per second, and then it goes up, sort of again, a smooth uh, one meter high hill. Will it make it to the top? 
So it's just a yes or no, A, yes, uh, B, no, although I think you might need to work something out. I've left some room for doing some math here. C is you can't answer without knowing the mass of the puck, that's the problem. Or D, you can't answer without knowing th what the angle of this hill is, which I haven't shown here. So if you can't answer it, answer it. If you can't answer it, answer C or D. Thirty seconds. Check your neighbor. Yep. <laughs> You guys got an answer for this one, please? And then I'll, I'll work it out. You're neglecting friction. So there's no external work, I think. Let's see what people are saying. Survey says. Let's see if this one works. Uh, a lot of people don't think it can reach the top of the hill. And when I worked this out before class, I thought the same thing. But the idea here is that um, let's assume uh, that yes, it makes it. And then I guess just, just work it out and see if it makes any sense. I guess I could figure out how fast it's sliding at the top of the hill or something like that. So I could say, um, one half m v initial squared plus, and let's set uh, h initial equals zero plus zero equals one half um, m v final squared plus m g h final. That's I think what I would do is just assume mix it up here, and then find out the like, v final. And so. Um, what I get is uh, uh, so one half. I think I can divide both sides by m, right? I can say m's cancel because there's an m in every single term. Let's say that v initial squared over two is equal to. Um, Uh, v final squared over two plus m so plus g times h final. So I could, I guess, v final squared over two is equal to um, 
the initial square root over two, so that's like four square root over two minus 9.8 times one. And I ended up with uh, eight minus 9.8 is v final squared over two. So I get uh, v, v final squared over two is equal to negative uh, 1.8. And uh, squares can't be negative. <laughs> Get an imaginary. I mean, there's a lot of ways of thinking of this, but uh, does that sort of make sense? <laughs> if you get an imaginary final speed, then it's, it means it's not going to happen in physics. Yep. <laughs> you got the mic. <laughs> um, can you just find, like, the height when the velocity is zero instead. That's even better, yeah, that's a good way to do it. <laughs> How high does it get up, I guess? But I guess if, it, if it got greater than one, then maybe it would, it would just probably stay on the track but keep it with some final speed, but that's, that's good. Yeah, there's another good way of doing it, it's just how high does it get up? It turns out it doesn't get up to one meter and it's gonna turn around. That's what'll actually happen, actually, so that's a good idea. Even better. Okay, awesome. Okay, so now we're on to uh, Hooke's Law. So let me go through this real quickly. Basic idea is that if you stretch a rubber band, then there's a force that's produced. Uh, also, if you give bend other things, like a ruler or uh, lots of objects, you get what's called a restoring force, which wants to restore that bendy object, like a rubber band or a ruler, um, back to its unstretched or equilibrium state. And there's an equation called Hooke's Law. It was invented long ago by James Hooke, um, which is Fx, so the fourth component of the force in the x direction, is equal to negative k times x, where k is called the spring constant. Uh, it has units of newtons per meter. You can measure this. And um, the minus sign there reminds you that F sub uh, X is a restoring force. Okay, and keep in mind, I think it's good to keep in mind that Hooke's law is an approximate equation and it really only works if uh, the absolute magnitude of X is kinda, kinda small. Question back here, yep. Just one question, so why is it negative? Yeah, great question. So. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, in terms of magnitudes, it's just the force is equal to k times x. The minus sign, so that's what I usually do, is that I think about if the spring is compressed, it's going to push. If the, if the spring is stretched, it's going to pull. Um, but I guess if you look at it on, on, the, on the diagram there, if you set x equals 0 to be like the unstretched position, then if you pull it to a positive x, then the force is negative. So that's why k is a positive number, and so they've put that minus sign in there just to... Force is negative, the force is positive. Yeah, if the, if, yeah, if the, dis, if the uh, displacement's positive, the force is negative. Also, if the, for, if the displacement's negative, the force is positive, right? So it's an opposite direction force to the displacement of the end of the spring. That's what the minus sign does. Do, don't springs wear out over time? How is that accounted for? Someone asked that this morning. Really good point. So Hooke's law, again, is approximate and it only works usually with sort of brand new springs coming out of the box. They're in good working condition and it isn't stretched or compressed too much. So I think we all probably have a slinky at home that got destroyed <laughs> at some point. When we were kids, uh, have you ever destroyed a slinky? Yeah, I've destroyed a few of those in my time and so have my kids. And, um, and those don't obey Hooke's law anymore, <laughs> okay, because they're all wrecked up. And also, I think if you use a spring too much, that spring constant, even if it does obey Hooke's law, can change over time. Are there cases that the elastic force on the object is not proportional to distance? Once again, the answer is in real life, yes. In this course on a problem set or a test, probably not. I'm gonna, <laughs> we're gonna use Hooke's law a lot and assume that the, that the, that it's a, it's, it's correct over your small little stretching or compressing that you're doing in this course. And then this, here's a great question, and I even have a slide for this one, so let's, we'll go to the next slide. If the magnitude of the force exerted on a spring is, on an object is k times x, then 
why is the work done not kx times x, which would be kx squared? It turns out to be a half kx squared. That's what we're going to do next. So, great question. Elastic potential energy. So there's this idea that if you pull a spring, then the stretched spring pulls back on the finger. And remember, work equals force times distance, and the force is this, um, where's the negative sign? <laughs> Somehow the minus sign has gone there, but I guess maybe I'm just looking at the magnitude of the force is proportional to, to x. Or maybe I'm talking about the force of the finger on the spring. I think that's why the minus sign went away. So the force of the spring on the finger is negative kx, but the force of the finger on the spring is equal and opposite, right? So it's the positive. I think that's where the, that's where the minus sign went. So you would think kx times x is kx squared, but you'd be wrong. So keep in mind that the force started at zero and kx is just the maximum. Right? I guess it's at that moment when you got to x. Now it is a kx. So you went from zero all the way up. And so there's an integral of a triangle, and it's one half base times height. Of it. That's where the half comes from. Can you imagine that? It's linearly proportional. So, um, so, so by the way, wrong. <laughs> and this is correct. That's where the factor of half comes from, but that was a good question. The work done on the spring is equal to the energy you put the, in the spring. That is a form of potential energy. So, we have a mousetrap set up here, <laughs> which is that somebody has loaded this spring with a bunch of potential energy. And if you touch this right here, then and there's also a bucket full of ping pong balls. And if you push this down just a little bit, <laughs> it scares me every time. All that elastic potential energy gets converted into the kinetic energy of all the ping pong balls and makes a, a giant mess. So again, thanks to Jonathan for setting that up. All right, works for compression or pulling. Um, consider a before and after situation. This comes up a lot on problems, uh, problem set problems is that you start off with the ball compressed against a spring and it's not moving. And then the spring pushes it and gets it moving. And you use uh, conservation of energy uh, by adding, I guess, a new potential energy. So same way we did U sub G, we had some sort of, um, I guess, conversion of gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy. Same thing can happen with U sub S. You can convert the stored spring potential energy to kinetic energy. Again, by just using conservation of energy. So let's do a, uh, oh, oh, this was on this morning's quiz. Um, just quickly going over this. When a bowstring is stretched all the way back and held in this position, this means that V is zero. So it's, there's no kinetic energy. It's all stored elastic potential. And then it says you, you stretch it, I guess, by three times as much, and, it, and it's still obeying Hooke's law. I would say that... Um, from this one, maybe us, like initial, is one half uh, k times x1 squared, and x2 is three times x1. So us2 is one half k times three x1 uh, squared. You just plug that in there, and then you, you end up with um, three squared times us1. So it's nine. US one. So you've, you've increased the potential energy by a factor of nine, I think. There's a lot of questions to, about explaining that one. So it, there it is. Okay. So let's do a example. A moving car has four 40,000 joules of kinetic energy, and it's moving at a speed of seven meters per second. A spring-loaded automobile bumper compresses uh, three meters when the car hits a wall and stops. What can you learn about the bumper's spring using this information? So I think it's gonna be the spring constant, but let's 
just draw it. So what you are doing here is you have a car. It's going with some K initial is 40,000 joules. And that's, I guess, equal to one half MB initial squared. So I guess we can probably figure out what the mass is of a car. Then there's a wall and a spring. I don't know if the spring's attached to the car or attached to the wall, but anyway, there's a spring there. And then finally, what happens is that there's the same wall, but now the spring gets compressed and the car stops. So V final equals zero, and then there's some like distance, X final, that the spring compresses. So there's gonna now be some, so U uh, spring initial equals zero because the spring is unstretched at the beginning and there'll be some U um, spring final is one half KX final squared. Does that make sense? And if you wanna do the simplifying diagram step, I would say that the kinetic energy initial plus the U spring initial equals the kinetic energy final plus the U spring final. And you can do it in terms of these bar charts, same sort of thing, it stops. So um, I would say one half mass times V initial squared. Well, actually you have kinetic energy, so a plus zero plus, or just equals um, zero plus one half K times X final squared. And then it's x final is equal to 0 0.3 meters. So solving that out, I'm not going to have to use v initial, just k initial is equal to 1 half uh, k, little k, times x final squared. Maybe let's find spring constant. Because we know everything except the spring constant. So uh, little k is equal to 2 little k equals two times big K divided by x final squared. It's two times the 40,000 joules, all in SI units, divided by 0 0.3 squared. So we've got k is equal to, whoa, 8.9 times 10 to the five newtons per meter. That's pretty big. But I guess that's, I guess you have to stop an entire car with it, so I guess that makes sense. Okay. How are we doing? Time's up. Okay. So this is an energy diagram. You're showing energy versus position. And it looks like a parabola. So these are kind of useful and you, they come up sometimes even in chemistry. You're looking at potential energy versus position where you're moving something around. Here it's a mass that's sitting on a spring. So the U sub S curve is determined by the properties of the spring, I guess, and what the, what the external force is. And then you can actually put energy into the system by, by moving it or something. You can set the total energy to any height you wish, I guess, in this by getting something, giving something an initial velocity, and then it'll kind of oscillate there in its little potential well. So there's other U sub S curves. Here's another one, a more general sort of diagram. You have a particle that's released from rest at position X1. Um, the kinetic energy, which is the difference between the total energy and the potential, is zero at that point, so it's released from rest, and then it's gonna move to the right. It tends to slide down the curve, I guess, because uh, it's gonna pick up kinetic energy as it goes towards the right. It'll speed up from X1 to X2, and then it slows down as the potential energy goes up again. And 
then speeds up again, gets to its maximum, maximum speed at x4. And then when it gets to x5, the speed goes to zero, and that's called a turning point. It'll turn around at that point and then go backwards. So it'll sort of oscillate back and forth. And you see this with covalent bonds sometimes. Um, here is energy versus the distance, the atomic separation between two protons in a, in a um, hydrogen H2 molecule. So it turns out that there is, a, there is a minimum in the potential energy, and that's where they, they tend, tend to be the, the separation. So minimum potential energy gives equilibrium separation of the molecule. Okay. Let's do a... I think I will give a, a problem set problem that has something to do. It looks a little bit like that. All right. Let's do another top hat question. A car starts with some speed VI, but the driver puts on the brakes and the car slows to a stop. As the car is slowing down, that initial kinetic energy, since it's slowing down, must be getting transformed into something else. So maybe give me the main other form of energy that it's getting transformed into. Is it A, gravitational, uh, B, elastic, potential energy, uh, C, internal thermal energy, or D, rest energy? Think pair share, please. Maybe go with your gut on this one. 20 seconds. Vote an answer, please. <laughs> okay. Survey says. Uh oh. That did not quite work out as it was supposed to. Um, I was watching lessons in chemistry last night and she pulls the lasagna out of the oven at the end and it's all burnt. She said, that was not the intended result. There's all sorts of euphemisms for that. Okay, well, forget about that. <laughs> I'm having top hat issues today. Uh, the one I like is internal thermal energy. Um, so that's, that's my idea here, is it's not going up or down, so the gravitational potential energy is not changing. There's no spring involved, I think. What's going on is that the brake pads in your brakes are pushing up against the, some rotors or something like that inside the tire, and it's creating a lot of heat. And that's what's slowing down your car. That's how brakes work. So if you didn't get it, no problem. It's, a, it's basically whether you, this is almost an automotive question. How do cars work? Well, this is, now you know how cars work. When you step on the brake pedal, you're actually creating heat and changing all that um, kinetic energy into, into heat energy. Unless, if you have an electric car, I think it does actually um, recharge your battery a bit as you're, as you're slowing down. So this is about friction. Friction can do work. Uh, if you displace a box some distance d, there's a kinetic friction opposite the, dis uh, oops, opposite the displacement. Um, so that can change internal energy. So if we choose the box as our system, then the friction is doing work on that system. If you pick the surface and the box, then you could say that there's, the forces are internal and you have a new energy called delta U internal or something. 
And this now becomes a positive number. So, I don't know if this is going to work. Um, yeah, we can do it. So the way it would look is that as you're dragging along, um, you would say there's positive work done by, on the ro by the rope on the box, but the surfaces are warmer and scratched, gaining positive internal energy. I'm assuming. So if I, let's do one more question actually, if we can do this. So if I push my box initially at rest across the carpet to the other side, so we're gonna do the exact same question we started off with. But now I want you to identify in this equation all of the terms that are not zero. So once again, initial, it starts at rest. Then in this thing I push it across the floor and then it stops. Final is it's at rest. And I define the system now to include the carpet, the floor and the box. <laughs> this is a slightly different question than I answered, asked at the beginning. I asked if the, at the begin, the first question was setting the system to the, be the box. Now I include the, the carpet there. So I'm hoping you're able to select more than one. You're not? <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, then. <laughs> That's third top hat glitch of the day, I think. Okay, it's possible that this top hat is not working, in which case you can choose any of the things you think are not zero. I would like you to choose two, but if it's not working, that's fine. Um, of all the following quantities, which are not zero? So it starts at rest, so initial kinetic energy is zero. It ends at rest, so final kinetic energy is zero. Um, it doesn't change its height. So if you define the box to have zero height when it's on the floor, then this is zero and this is zero, just by definition. Okay. This is by definition. You can set the zero height of, of uh, gravitational potential energy, potential energy to be whatever you want. So I'm going to set it to be the floor. So what happens is that I do some positive work this is the work I do on the box, because I am an external force, and that's positive. Do on the box. Positive. And then this is also positive. This is um, Fk times D, also positive. So by definition, this change in internal energy of a system is a positive number. I kind of like to think of it as the heat that's, that's left in the floor. And that has a value of Fk times, times D. So remember, the change in energy of the system is uh, delta E. So the way we like to look at this is E initial is E initial plus the change in energy is the final energy. So the change in energy of a system is the work that you do in the system. And this is supposed to remind you a little of the impulse momentum theorem from chapter six, which is that the initial momentum plus the impulse was equal to the final momentum. Here you've got the final energy, initial energy plus the work is the uh, final energy. So I'll do this example next time. Before Friday, maybe finish off with chapter seven. I'm gonna post a problem set on this stuff. And let's think about gravitational potential energy. MGY is the same somehow as negative GMM over R. And so how could those two equations that look different uh, be actually the same? We'll talk about that on Friday. See you then.